and go back to my Canva and go full screen with that. Yep. Do you see it? Well, I, I got to oh, okay. go on my phone to do it. Okay. Oh, it's, yeah, it's showing up on my alerts. Okay. Uh, Have a good show. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Vintage Motocross Radio. I'm your host, Joe Abadi. If you get a moment, you're watching on YouTube or on your phone, please share the show. Let some friends know that you're watching or listening to Vintage Motocross Radio. This program is made possible with the help of our sponsors, Nightmare Racing, the best reproduction Kawasaki plastic on the planet. Preston Petty, the legend continues. Amsoil, the first in synthetic oil since 1973. Full Circle Racing, rims, spokes, lacing, and truing for all your vintage and modern bikes. Motion Pro, for specialized tools, cables, and controls. Vinco, keep the ride going with over 650 products in their catalog. Be sure to visit all of our sponsors online and on Facebook. And don't forget, next week, please join me on October 25th. My guest will be David Bailey. Before I begin, I'd like to thank a friend of mine, Charlie Robinson, who has introduced Guy Cooper and I, who's the person we're going to be uh, interviewing in just a moment. My guest this morning, of course, I just said Guy, was a uh, 83 Oklahoma State champion. In 1984, he was the AMA Rookie of the Year. In 1992 and 93, he was uh, awarded the Mickey Thompson Award for Excellence. Of course, in 1990, he was the 125 AMA national champion. In 93, he was a world supercross champion. 97, German supercross champion. In 94 and 96, he was a gold medal winner in the international six-day enduro. He was also, uh, well, I'll tell you, in 2002, and I'm going to have him on in just a minute. I can't believe this. It, at 40 years old, he came back and rode nationals again in 2002 at 40 years old. So with the exception of just a three-year uh, hiatus, Guy has ridden motocross and entered so many events for 22 years. It's my privilege this morning to have with me Mr. Guy Cooper. Guy, are you with me? Yes, I am, Joe. Good morning. Good morning to you, Guy, and thank you. Depending on where you're at. <laughs> and, and, and just thank you for, for taking the time to speak to us today. You know, of, uh, of all the guests I've had over, uh, over the past, uh, gosh, four months, I guess, it seems every week somebody sends in some kind of question or has something to say about my guest. I got so many for you. It was absolutely incredible, including a, a mutual friend of ours this morning, Chris Carter, who tells me that uh, he's going to be out at your place in just about two weeks for some kind of a ride. That's right. We have a, a dual sport ride that starts at a museum uh, close to Oklahoma City and does all back roads and some single track. And then we have lunch here at my place with the museum and then uh, all roads back. It's Sooner Adventure Ride for all you guys out there with uh, dual sport bikes um, from a 350 KTM all the way up to uh, 1250 BMWs. It's, it's a fun, good ride. And it looks like the weather's going to be perfect. That's great. And I understand my old friend Gerald Timms is going to be there, too. Gerald does, yes. He's the one who started that uh, about 10 or 12 years ago. All right. One, one last hello from somebody before we get into the question. Selvaraj Narayana called me this morning from KTM, and he sends his regards, too. All right. Nice to see you, Sel. Oh. Hey, hey, Guy, you know, handling from the great state of, of Oklahoma, it makes me want to ask about a minicycle career being Ponca City is there. Did, did you get your start on minicycles? Well, I raced minicycles, but uh, not – what everyone thinks with Ponca City being right there. In 1974, I raced an XR75 at Ponca City, but it was long before the NMA was there. Um, I, I raced local, mm -hmm. just um, Stillwater and uh, Cushing Motocross. Uh, and so um, to answer that question, yes, I raced Ponca City NMA in 81, which landed me in uh, Team Green Ride, and then 83, which um, – catapulted me into uh, riding the nationals. I got it. I got it. So uh, there, there's so many things I want to cover. And I know that bicycle motocross was a was a big part of your life, too. When did you get started in that? And uh, did it coincide with your motorcycle career? Or was that something completely separate? 
you could say I was born on two wheels. My parents had a bicycle shop and a motorcycle shop. Mm -hmm. I grew up uh, working at the bicycle shop. And so I, I was really, really into the BMX, all the way from the transition of a Schwinn Stingray with motorcycle handlebars and a 10-speed seat on it, all the way through um, to where it was dedicated BMX bicycles and the ABA and the NBA um, being uh, grassroots all the way up. Sure. Now, what, what BMX bikes did you like at that time? Where And were there some racers that you looked up to in BMX? Well, we sold Schwinn and Raleigh were our two big lines, but um, I remember a Moxie. Um, a lot of people won't know that, but it was a fairly large frame. Right. And I liked the larger, even though I was a runt, I was a little guy. Um, I liked the larger uh, bicycle because when you really launched it, it seemed like you had more control of the bike. And so um, I had a PK Ripper and a Matthews Monoshock and the Rampar aluminum frame. I think it was called an R11. Okay. Uh, and local riders, uh, Dallas Labrada always was the, the guy that comes to mind because he was the, the local hero around here. And um, Todd Slavic's probably listening here. He's he's a friend of mine that raced in Texas and came up and raced uh, one of our biggest races we had here in Oklahoma uh, back in the day. So but, uh, how, how far did the BMX thing actually go? Did you get like a national number and were you a professional oh, in BMX also? No, I, I couldn't finish in the top 10 at a local race. I, <laughs> I just was, I back to what I was saying, I was a runt. I, I just didn't have uh, the skills in my age group mm -hmm. uh, to be competitive racing. I, I really enjoyed it. I could do all the freestyle tricks and everything, even before it was something that was an art. You know, they went after I pretty much got into the motorcycle side of things. Then it became what they called the, the Flatlander freestyle stuff or the freestyle ramps. But I remember in the early 80s going to skateboard parks and riding in the skateboard parks doing tricks and things. But, um, yeah, it, it was just uh my the way the bmx racing was by age group i just i wasn't competitive I but it. i did have my own track it was pretty neat i had my own track behind the motorcycle shop in 1979 we had the aba summerline tour uh which uh, we had race, racers from california uh all the way across and uh, that was a enjoyable time back in the day it was a real short track all downhill in oklahoma it's pretty fun Pretty fun place. So then tell me about when you first got interested in, in motorcycles. Was it a mini bike life for you at the beginning? And, and how did that all take place? Well, I mean, I, I had a mini trail 50, a QA 50, a SL 70. Um, my brothers raced. I have two older brothers and a younger brother. Mm -hmm. And my, my oldest brother rode the nationals in 74 on a Penton. And my dad, took him to a lot of races and they did tons of racing. And I was just a fence guy that got to watch races and everything. Uh, watching the two fastest Oklahoma riders back in the seventies would have been Trey Jorsky and Chuck, my brother. And so uh, then later on, uh, you know, the transition was I wanted to race motorcycles. Mm -hmm. I was good through the week and I didn't get grounded. Then I could go race whatever was on the showroom you know there there might be a used xr75 or an sl70 or a mini trail 50 and i would go race it on the weekend but really that's about um uh the extent of my amateur career <laughs> you could say i grew up on two wheels but it wasn't a heavily based let's go uh chase a, a series i see it was you know your, your dad did have have a motorcycle shop and uh i, I wanted to know more about that i i kind of discovered some things uh, about your dad and, and the Cooper family uh, as far as their bicycle business and, and all their motorcycle influences that they had. So where was your dad a dealer and what lines did he represent? What was that about? Uh, I, I, could, I could talk for hours here, but I'll try to condense it. Okay. Uh, my dad at 12 years old started selling bicycle parts. Mm -hmm. And it was in my grandfather's harness shop that had um, leather goods for horse and buggies and my dad started selling bicycle parts and that became more profitable than the harness shop and so they my my grandfather passed away uh, sometime during 
uh, this this was all after the depression. You're talking 1931, 1933. Yes. Um, so uh, when my grandfather passed away, my dad really was the provider of the family with the bicycle parts and started selling LaSalle bicycles, which was a Schwinn bicycle, but there was already a Schwinn dealer in town. So the BF Goodrich, LaSalle, uh, Liberty, there were different uh, badges that you could sell the Schwinn bicycle under. And um, he developed that into a, a large shop and wrestled the Schwinn um, franchise away from the, the small shop. And uh, in the 70s, sold over a thousand Schwins a year. So really big bicycle shop at a Oklahoma State University campus. And uh, motorcycles, he hitchhiked in 1948 to Massachusetts and went through the Indian uh, mechanic school and came back and opened an Indian dealership and really liked the vertical twin Indians. Uh, my parents got married and took their honeymoon on Indian twins. Uh, he, that was just a bike that he liked. Even though it wasn't competitive, he raced that thing all the way into the mid-60s and traded it in for um, when he opened the Honda franchise in 62. Uh, finally got him off the Indian onto uh, a Honda S90. And that was his uh, bike of choice for up until like the TL125. And he cut the bars down on the TL125 so he could snake through the trees and try to beat his kids on the. <laughs> my dad would rather see me ride Enduros than motocross. All my brothers rode Enduros. Uh -huh. And uh, let me ask you this. I mean, it's not in my questions, but of course, your story is prompting this. Did your mom ride a little mini bike at all? Was she always on the property riding on something? My mom rode. She was actually a really good rider. There's um, some of the old friends that talk to us say that uh, my mom, Mary Ellen, was uh, a better rider than my dad. But, <laughs> um, she does. My dad would say, comment back in the day, that she had more trophies than he did. But of course, you know, if you're talking in the 1950s, there might only be four or five women riding motorcycles. This is where there were hundreds that would show up to a field meet yeah. um, to ride their Harley or Indian. What were some of the other motorcycle brands that your, your dad was a uh, representative of at that time? Well, Indian, of course, and, and Whizzer motorcycles in the, the late 40s. And then in 53, when Indian went out of business um, and started bringing imports in, then it was the Matchless, Royal Enfield, um, Norton, Ducati. Uh, well, Ducati's not a... Uh, British bike. There was a ton of British bikes in there. Sure. Royal Enfield Matchless being the main two that he liked. But uh, it wasn't until he saw the Japanese bikes uh, in the late 50s. And he was actually one of the first Yamaha dealers in this part of the country. Uh, in 1959, he took on Yamaha. And the funny story, backstory to that is the clutch purchase broke on the, Indi on the showroom floor. Mm. And so he was really upset that the uh, Japanese motorcycles weren't going to have good enough uh, metals to survive and last. So um, he used it more as a, you want to buy a British bike over a Japanese bike because this'll, this is why and that type of thing. Well, he kept seeing Hondas and he opened a Honda dealership, uh, brought it on in 62 and Bridgestone and Hodaka and Kawasaki in 67 through like 69. Had, had quite a few Japanese bikes, then brought on Penton, Boltaco. Um, so we had quite a few bikes. Yeah, it, it certainly sounds like it. And at that time, uh, you know, it, well, I guess Boltaco wasn't really, uh, really that popular in America just about at that time. But certainly the British bikes were, and there seemed to be a lot of British, uh, British bikes in your life at that time. So um, you were nicknamed Airtime by someone in the press. Do you know when that happened? How you got the name Airtime? Obviously, well, obviously from your jumping, but was it somebody who specifically said that that you remember? It probably stems back to 1986. I'm at the Supercross in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, mm -hmm. and there was a, a triple before a set of whoops. And it was one of those things where you couldn't mess up your triple because it did go straight into a, a rough set of whoops. But uh, I, I had nothing to lose. I had crashed and I was back in the back markers. And so uh, I attempted that triple on my uh, 86 CR250 and I hit that jump in first gear pinned and it would just it orbit me straight up. But then 
the landing was right where right where it needed to be, where I could still slow down and catch the whoops. And so uh, a real technical triple. And I was the only one that did it all night. I didn't make the main, but in the last chance qualifier, I fell and got up and was hitting that triple every lap. And the crowd crowd was just going crazy. So um, who was the guy that was announcing? Um, Mike Lafferty's uncle. Um, I'm drawing a blank on who um, was the announcer. Uh, well, the only guy that comes to mind about announcing, and I don't know if he was doing it. Um, Larry Myers. Larry Myers. No, or Larry yeah. Larry Huffman. Which one? Larry Myers. Larry, Larry Myers. Myers uh, he had me come back out, even though I had finished like seventh in the last chance qualifier. He mm -hmm. had me come back out and talk to me, and that was pretty much where it landed. Um, you know, watch this kid. He's he's jumping anything. <laughs> and even Suzuki uh, sent me a flyer or a picture. Uh, with me doing a one-hander off the triple and said, you know, uh, congratulations on your uh, race or whatever. And uh, I still have that. It's kind of neat. Now, you won the Oklahoma State Championship in 1983, but you turned professional in 1980. What were some of the events you participated in in, in those three years before winning the state championship? And what bikes were you on at that point? Well, in 1980, I graduated high school, um, uh, summer of 1980. My brother's 78 CR250 sitting on the showroom and some friends are going to the local race in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And I borrow my bike, my brother's bike and race 59th. I, I had raced many bikes and maybe a few on uh, CR125, a bike that would be in. But when I was 14, 15, 16, I could ride a BMX bicycle real well because I matched the size to that. Motorcycles, I could hardly touch the ground if I got even on a 74 CR125. I was a runt, so um, just very little racing until 1980, and then I went down and raced my brother's 250, and something clicked. It was like that's all I cared to do. I, I would put the time in at the shop uh, to warrant uh, my parents letting me go race next weekend or whatever, you know, so uh, that, that was uh, something clicked then that that's what I wanted to do, and uh, it pursued my career, and started putting little goals out there, you know, yeah. this week, you know, beat this guy. And, you know, so I, I look back on my career as a whole bunch of short goals, um, reachable goals. And then you got your big goals championship and that type of thing down the road, but all your little goals have to be met before you can reach the big ones. Now, were you, I guess, employed in your, whether it was the bicycle shop or the motorcycle shop, that's what you did for work all this time? Yes, I uh, worked in my parents' bicycle shop, went to Schwinn School in 1977 in Chicago, and um, it, whenever I, 1980, I think it was 81, I went to Honda Step School, um, the mechanic school that they have, it's like a week long, it was in Dallas, and uh, so, yes, and honestly, I wasn't a very good employee, you know, when you're working for your parents, you're always trying to get out of it, I was, I was a lazy kid, <laughs> If I could earn enough time to go ride, that's all that mattered. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, let's let's back up a second here. You said you went to school uh, for Schwinn. What, what what do you do at what do you do at a bicycle school? What what happens there? Uh, oh, Schwinn school was awesome. My dad took almost. I had three or four. I had four sisters. I think three of the sisters even went to Schwinn school. Hmm. It's awesome. They they um, it, it's a week long and. You learned to lace wheels, and back then you had to take a Sturmy Archer three-speed hub apart, put it back together, and, you know, just you basically had to know all the lineup of the Schwinn bicycles and uh, understand it, which all of our kids, all the, all the kids in my family were, um, we were, we flew through it. I, I think I was uh, 15 years old, but uh, Chuck, I believe, he was 11 when he first went to Schwinn school. Wow. Yeah, there is, you know, there's a bit more, I guess, to bicycles than I'm thinking about at this time between, you know, as you said, Sturmy Archer hubs or 10-speed derailers and stuff like yeah. that. And, you know, it's that's not something that just anybody can uh, understand how to adjust. And, yeah, I can understand it now how, uh, how spending a week at a school like that, especially with lacing wheels, which I'm sure may have come in handy later on in your motorcycle career as well. Yeah, I, and I always enjoyed lacing wheels. So even for some of the factory guys, um, I remember whenever I'd be in the pits and some of the factory Honda guys would have wheels, they'd hand me the wheels and I'd lace it up to them for them and hand it back to them. So all they had to do is true it up and they'd be done. 
Now, Guy, you were you were paying your dues from 1980 uh, all the way through 1984. Um, you you actually had a van stolen from you, but your determination to go on racing just continued and it never stopped. When that van was gone, what did you do and how did you get to the races? Well, I in 1983 at Punka, I had one motos, but I didn't do any. I, I think fourth overall was the best I did. Mm -hmm. As an overall, because either I won or I crashed. That's kind of the way it went back in the day. And uh, Honda sent me a contract. Kawasaki sent me a contract for 25% off of two bikes if I stayed amateur. We were already a Kawasaki dealer, so it wasn't that big of a uh, benefit. And Honda said they would send me a contract. And uh, I need to back this up a little bit. Yeah, sure. Where I said my, my brother raced the nationals and, and he rode and my dad went with him for about five years. They went out and they really pursued it. And they came back with the attitude, you kind of need to be in California. You have to have a name made out there to land any type of making a living at it. And so when it was in my blood, I said, I've got to do this. I want to do this. Chuck had the opportunity. My mom said, we'll give you two years of supporting you, making sure you can make it to the races and stuff. But after that, if you don't land a contract or something that you can actually um, sustain yourself, you need to find a real job. Meaning, I wasn't a very good employee at the shop, so I was going <laughs> to find something for real. So after Punk City in 83, there was a fire department opening up a new one by my house. And so I um, filed the um, papers and did the first year, you know, there was like 300 applicants and they went down to 28 and I was in one of the 28. And so it was, if Honda hadn't sent the contract, I probably would be a fireman instead of a motorcycle guy. But I finally got this contract from Honda. It was five motorcycles, uh, $2,000 in parts and $2,000 travel expense. And I signed that thing and sent it back next day, AM delivery FedEx to make sure they didn't change their mind. I didn't realize Honda had a lot of money at that time, and I probably could have got to double my contract had I negotiated, but I, I was happy to get it, and that was the beginning. So you were almost a fireman, but then you got a factory Honda contract. Well, it's not factory. It was factory support. Factory it, support. It a, there's a huge difference, although that, that it is, um, I felt like it was a factory ride. So yeah, that was good. So when the van got stolen in 84, I had three of my motorcycles. Um, and Boisberger and Steve Bayless were friends of mine that we all traveled. Their motorcycle got stolen as well. So five motorcycles, uh, my moped, I had two Honda Expresses and uh, two King Sting mountain bikes, all my tools, everything was gone. Mm. Um, and, but I did still have two motorcycles still coming in from Honda. And so my parents had the Honda dealership. So I had uh, my brother, I worked with my parents. They agreed to uh, switch the VIN numbers when they come in and let me uh, take one of theirs off the showroom. And so Chuck set the bike up, um, you know, uh, serviced it, rode it up and down the alley, got it to where it was uh, ready to go moto. And when my parents brought it down, because it, it was stolen five days before uh, the first outdoor national in Florida. And so my parents drove it down Medicine, Florida, and I took that motorcycle into practice and then to the line without change. I didn't check the air pressure. I didn't move a lever. I didn't do anything because, you know, I always looked up to Chuck like he could set the bike up. I took it straight to the line and raced it and got sixth, my first moto out on a box stock 84 CR 1.5. Mm -hmm. Stock tires, everything. Now, I, I Steel handlebars. I'm <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, how did you continue on after that? I, I, I thought I read something about you bought a, a, a Cutlass Calais or uh, a Cutlass Supreme, Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme Braum. Yeah. <laughs> that was the loaded one. Uh, it had the chrome bumpers. No, oh, it's crazy. I, I uh, When I graduated high school, uh, the brothers in the family, my dad would buy them a car um, for graduating. And I talked my dad into a Austin Healey 3000 for $1,800. And so that was kind of the, my trophy for graduating high school. And so when this bike got stolen, I took that Austin Healey 3000 and traded it with money to a used Cutlass Supreme 
<laughs> so it was an awful trade, but I needed something. So I took that Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme with a three bike open trailer. And uh, that, that was what I finished out 1984 with. Now, it, am I, maybe I'm mistaken. I don't think so. Weren't you like rookie of the year in 84? I, yes, I was. Yeah, it was you, he, he, Dubon, Doug Dubok and I battled for the rookie of the year position that year. So you, your Cutlass Calais, a three rail trailer, went and became rookie of the year in 1984. I just can't imagine anything yeah. even close My to budget, that. I, I spent six thousand dollars to travel to all twelve nationals in 1984. I slept in the I slept in the car. I had a white towel that I'd go into the backside of the Motel Six, jump in the pool, do a hobo bath, and uh, get back in the car and and drive. Or th that was it. I tried to get a hotel the night before the national so I could sleep better than having the steering wheel wrapped around me. Sure. And uh, you know it's just a low budget, all out there going for it. Now did did Honda take notice of that? I mean they had to. And was your first real factory contact contract shortly after that? Um, Dave Arnold and I got along great. I did a lot of testing for Honda when, I, when I'd be in California. They'd, they'd give me a hotel and pay me to go r ride the bikes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoyed that part. So I know that Honda did see that I was an up-and-comer or – but I wasn't really a young kid. You know, I, I was 22 when I started the national. So um, I, I was a guy that they, they saw some skills and Roger would talk to me. And he actually in 1987 or 88 was going to have me ride a GP in Europe. And uh, I broke my leg at Tom Carson's house on his damn four wheeler just um, uh, three weeks before that event. So uh Different things, you know, you can always look back on that crystal ball and go, man, had I just done this or this, things could have changed. But I really got along with the Honda family. You know, my parents had a Honda dealership. I, I had a ton of respect for um, Roger DeCosta and Dave Arnold. And uh, so that that all was good. And each year it did get better and better. In uh, 1988, they said uh, Dave came Dave Arnold came to me and said, uh, if you didn't have to have your own mechanic, if we've supplied a mechanic, wait, in 1988, they go, if we gave you more money, yeah. would you go get a mechanic and would you fly into the races? And, you know, could you do it on $100,000? And $100,000 was like, you know, unbelievable amount of money. I said, <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. So that was the plan was Honda was going to give me $100,000 from 1988. And I was going to find a mechanic and all that. Well, when the contract finally came in, it was 77000 but it was eight motorcycles and, you know, a box van. So it was everything, but just not quite the hundred. And um, Yamaha calls me and asks me what's going on. And I said, well, I thought I was getting a $100,000 contract from Honda. And, and uh, so the next day, here comes this Yamaha contract. A hundred thousand dollars, eight motorcycles, a box van for a lease, and I mean it was what Honda said they'd do. And so I called Dave Arnold and said, "Hey, I've got this Yamaha contract, and you know, can you do anything?" And Dave goes, "Man, I, I we don't have any more budget." And you know, I said, "Well, twenty thousand dollars is a lot more." And Dave, Dave gave me the, you know, have a have a good time with racing, and you know, sorry to see you go. And so. I hung up at my parents' Honda shop. I was on the phone on, on the direct line at the Honda shop. They're all calling me traders that I was going to go to Yamaha. <laughs> well, uh, so I signed the Yamaha contract and told the Yamaha guys, you'll have the contract the next day. And Roger DeCoster calls me from Belgium and says, uh, guy, don't leave Honda. I, I promise you, uh, I, I get you the very best parts and, you know, gives me this feel that I need to stay with Honda. And I go, Roger, it's not about, I, I like my Hondas. I just, $20,000 difference is a lot. Sure. And uh, he goes, did you send the contract in? I go, no. And he goes, well, if you haven't sent it in yet, a verbal doesn't, that's not binding. Um, give me five minutes. And about five minutes later, Dave, Dave Arnold calls me back and says, you'll have a contract tomorrow morning. And uh, it came back at 97000 the next morning so i signed that contract wrote an apology letter to yamaha and sent it in but 
that's why in 1989, when John Michelle Bale signed with Honda and I didn't have a ride to go to, Yamaha was pissed at me. So I couldn't, I couldn't even go talk with them. And Kawasaki had a full plate. And so all my option was, was to sign for, for Suzuki. So, and that, that it was a full factory ride. And I, the funny thing was, I liked the 250 and I didn't like the 125 when I went and rode them. And so I was all pumped on Supercross, thinking it was going to be my Supercross year. And uh, as it turned out, um, I, I, I really did well on the 125. And the 250 was uh, a learning curve for the next four years. That was my next question about how did the Suzuki contract come about? And, uh, you know, while we're on that and you are talking about money, how much more did Suzuki pay you the next year? Do you remember? Well, um, so I had a, in 88, it was a $97,000 contract with Honda. Mm. In 89, they go, let us take care of the mechanic and we'll pay you 72000 It's funny how I remember these, but 72000 But out of that, you've got to sign up, have your insurance, fly into the races, get your hotel, but we want you to fly in, not drive in. And so I agreed that I would be the, the guy to fly in and do that stuff. And um, so for eighty for eighty nine it was seventy two thousand. Mm -hmm. And in nineteen ninety, Suzuki offered me fifty thousand. And all the other there were seven factory riders, and I think Jeremy Buell and I were the only two that made less than a hundred thousand. The rest of the guys were a hundred thousand dollar riders. And anyway, um, it was something that I wasn't used to though. They gave you a per diem. So all your food was paid for, your hotel was paid for, your air flight, rental car, and all you did was fly in and race and fly home and send in your um, receipts and everything was reimbursed. So I loved it. It was unbelievable. You know, it was $50,000 that you could put in the bank. And so to me, uh, living out of Oklahoma, it, it was awesome. The sad thing was, is when I won the championship, Bob Hanna goes, don't talk to them until you win that championship and then go in. You can ask whatever money you want to. They haven't won a championship in eight years and you'll have them over the barrel. Do, do whatever you want to. So during silly season, I didn't do anything. I just sat back. Um, I won the championship. I bought me a nice suit. I go in to talk to <laughs> Tosh Koyama and the, the guy above him. And, uh, Tosh was an old fart. He was about 100 years old. And the other guy never went to a race. He was just the pencil pusher behind the desk. And I sat in there. I was super nervous. I went through my whole spiel, how I won him a championship. And uh, he finishes smoking his cigarette and uh, says, OK. And that was it. So I got up and walked out. And uh, they wouldn't go up on the price. They so kept at it. So I called Hannah. And he goes, oh, I'll get you something. He called me back and said, you got to sign for 75000 today or that they're not going to give you anything. So at holding the number one plate, I signed for 75000 And uh, two weeks after that, that was whenever Matasevich got in trouble in Europe, and uh, they signed him for $100,000. And all the other factory riders in 91, 92, and 93 all made 100. And I made 75 and 91, and 93, it went back to 50. And I, I signed it because it's all that's out there. But, you know, looking back on it, I really – there's so many things I wish I could have done different. But I didn't have the balls to say, you guys, this isn't fair, whatever. I didn't have a manager to go in there and fight for me. And it kind of goes back to my heritage of being an Oklahoma guy, $50,000, and go ride a motorcycle. That's yeah. awesome. You know, I mean, I, how can I bitch about that? You know, I, I can now. I can look back on it going, man, I, I wish I would have stood up to him. Because sometimes I think that's what they wanted. They wanted to see, they wanted to hear him go, I'm going to win. I'm, I want this. You know, and I'd go in and tell him the reality is in Supercross, I'll be top five and I'll be a crowd favorite and I'll give it 110%. And that you can take to the bank. Yeah. And, and you know what, too, guy? I mean, if you had made that other 50000 back then, you just spent that 50000 20 times over, and who knows what could have changed. You know, your, ma your name might not be in the history books. Things might have changed and, and gone in a different direction. Um, that 50000 is gone. That's true. There, there is so much to it. Yeah. I mean, but the bottom line is, is I was a racer from the heart. You know, I, I gave it my all, and um, it didn't matter if it was a local race or a national race. 
you know, you, you want to win, but you also like putting on a show. I, I was a big show off out there. Yeah, well, and, and and there's a lot of people that love that about you too. So, you know, you know, guy, you raced against at times and defeated so many legendary racers like Jeff Ward, Johnny O'Mara, Ron Lachine, LaRocco, Kudrowski. Now, in '90, you had to compete against Kudrowski, Emig, Bale, and Matasevich there for a minute, and LaRocco. You defeated Kudrowski that year. You won your national championship by just one point, which is a tough one, man. That means you had to really fight tooth and nail for that one. Would you consider that your toughest season or were there some of those other close second finishes in the nationals that you would say were much tougher seasons than the year you won? Well, you always look back at your achievements and so, and, and your goal setting. So a national championship is definitely your goal. And so you, let's go back and just fo focus on 1990. Yeah. While it was John Michelle Bale and I, and you'd think that I would be upset with Bale because he took the Honda ride. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have the, if Bale would have, wouldn't have signed for Honda, I would have still been on Honda. So Bale's on Honda. I'm on Suzuki. But I find out that he likes trials and I'm in trials. So here it is. We're battling each other on the weekends. And on Saturday before the event, I have a Fantic trials bike hidden. Suzuki didn't like it. Honda didn't like it that I brought my trials bike with me. And we'd set up a little trial section, and John Michelle Bale and I had ride on trials bikes until one of the Honda guys would catch him and, and run him off. And uh, so we got along good. And while that was going on, we were pulling ahead of the other guys. When Bale broke his arm at the halfway point, yeah, um, Bale and I were uh, like eight eight points apart. I think he actually had the lead on me, but. Uh, we had 60 points on Kudrowski in third place. So Bale breaks his arm. I have a 60 point lead and Suzuki comes to me and says, you can't do what you've been doing to win a championship. You need to train more. And so they sent me to California and they had me do all these tests, seeing how much oxygen's in my blood and doing these um, uh, fitness tests. And I'm horrible. I, I'm in terrible shape. You know, I, I ate McDonald's pancakes before the national. That was my, I, I went every race. I'd go catch my McDonald's breakfast and uh, through the week, um, you know, I, I like my um, honey buns and, and uh, chocolate. I, I just ate horrible. And uh, so they tell me I've got to change my ways. So they got me on all these pills, putting more oxygen in your blood and, but you had a I, you had a sixty point lead on Kudrowski. I had a sixty point lead. It shouldn't have been. Looking back on it, we shouldn't have changed the damn thing. But we did. We did all this stuff, and so and that was right after Unadilla. There was a four or five week break. So I'm in California. I'm doing all this testing and training, and then I come back home, and they've got a, a routine for me to to run four miles, to bicycle an hour, uh, to swim a mile. I mean, I started off dog paddling from one end of the pool to the other, and I couldn't swim for crap. But <laughs> it, uh, I learned to, you know, take three strokes and take a breath. And, you know, I, I developed into where I could swim a mile in under an hour, which was still not that good, but at least I learned to swim. And so I did do all that training without riding the motorcycle. And something should have clicked on to, something's wrong. When I drive back from the gym in my car down a two-lane road, I was staring right over the hood, just jerking the car back and forth, trying to stay between the lines. It was like I was on speed, you know? And so I go to the first national. I don't even break the top 10. I think I went 14-10 for 12th overall. And uh, I was riding horrible. Uh, I was super tight, tense. And and uh, the Suzuki guys were going, just let it all get into your system. You'll be fine. Just keep training. And uh, – so the next round, I was running sixth or eighth, a little better, but I'm still looking right over the front fender. And I remember this one at New York. Dubok was on the outside, and I was on the inside. And it went, you know, one of the jump downhill jumps. Yeah, you know, I Gilla? never looked up. I just followed my rut through and launched off the jump. Well, Dubok had been on the outside. He had come over in my lane, and I jumped right into him. We both sprawled out on the track. Another non-top ten finish. So my points are now down to about 30, and I, there's a two- or a three-week break after this one. This was back whenever there was quite a few breaks during the hot summer. Right. And so uh, 
I came back home from that race. I threw all the pills away. And that's when I built my big canyon jump and Rich Taylor and uh, uh, the, the, my local Oklahoma guys were all riding with me and stuff, Palmer and uh, Owens. And uh, so we, we uh, set my track up with death-defying jumps on it just because I go, if I'm going to lose it, I'm going to lose it my way. <laughs> and so I stopped riding the bicycle, stopped swimming, stopped running, and all I did was from morning till dark rode my motorcycle. And so coming back after that race, um, it was in Pennsylvania. I've got about a 20-second lead. I'm back to myself. Everything's good. And I want to put it in the record books that I am going to, win this championship right so i'm out there with a big lead still launching off the jumps while i land on some rocks and it breaks the cases of my rm125 and i dnf the moto so after that dnf with four and a half races left it makes the points i think we're four points apart leaving that race and so from that race on it was a battle between kudrowski and me so yeah from what a an easy race or easy championship that should have come my way came all the way down to the wire. Wow. And as they say, the rest is history. Just one point, I think it was 517 to 5, or 518 to 517. Yeah, I won it by one point. By one point. A guy, in, in 93, you raced 21 nationals in the USA, and you were a World Supercross champion. The World Supercross season is in the winter, I guess, just like it is here in the U.S., but where did you race for that title? What countries? What bike? Who was your mechanic? Did you live in Europe? Well, I was under a, uh, my Suzuki contract, although it had gone from a motocross contract to an off-road contract. But the European guys wanted me to show up. The promoters all liked me over there. So uh, the FIM opening round was in Italy. And Stefan Everts and Greg Albertine, uh, those guys were – you know, there was quite a few big names at the opening round of the FIM, and but it was muddy, and I won that event. And so, uh, of course, the promoters had to get me to go to the second round and the third round, and then Japan was even included in the FIM World Supercross Series. And I actually actually didn't have a contract to go to Japan, but because I was winning the FIM World Supercross title, mm -hmm. uh, they sent me over, and I was able to race the Japanese Supercross. And then it came back for a final round. But I know Italy, Spain, France, and Japan, and there was one other country that I, I can't remember where it was at. But, but that was in 1993. Then you went on, and, and, and you raced 21 nationals here, too, which, uh, I mean, that's that's quite a season, 1993. Yeah. Uh, well, I like racing in Europe. I could go to Europe and race for eight or ten weeks over there, which sometimes would be three days a week because there'd be a Tuesday night in Italy and then a Thursday night over here. Um, kind of like people talk about the way it used to be in California where you could race four or five times a week. Yes. Um, in the in the winter, the, the European promoters were all trying to get the Americans to come over and race. And I enjoyed it. I, I went anywhere. The guys would pay me and, and have me a bike set up. Now, did you were you also a German Supercross champion? In 97, uh, Wanda and I were invited to go ride the whole series. And so, uh, and again, I was on Suzuki off-road, but I raced Suzuki, uh, Suzuki's at the Supercross in Europe. Even though my contract wouldn't let me ride a Supercross in the U.S., I could ride in Europe. And uh, so I rode the uh, 11 race uh, Germany Supercross series in, in 97. It was awesome. A lot of fun. Now, you, you just mentioned something about having a, uh, an off-road contract and, and not having a, a motocross contract. Uh, in 94, I, and I think 96, you raced some international six-day Enduros where you won a gold medal. Where, where were those events? And was that, that was obviously on Suzuki yet? Yes. In 93, I kind of have to back up to 93. Sure. I, I was a full-time rider on, on motocross and supercross. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Suzuki, and they posted a, or they printed a poster saying farewell tour. It was never talked to me about it, but I've got <laughs> these posters that they were putting me out the patch, pasture at the end of 93, regardless. But at the end of 93, I went in for my sales pitch to say I still want to ride motocross and supercross for 94, but I have rods in both legs, and I want to get the rods taken out. 
and I want to heal up. But I make more money in Europe than I do with your Supercross co- or with your contract. So I'm going to go do my European stuff. And then December, I'll have my rods taken out. So I'll miss the first two months of Supercross. And uh, Tosh says, uh, we don't want some halftime rider. No contract. And basically ended the discussion. So I walked out of the room without a contract. And the off-road guys go, well, our season doesn't start till May or April. And if you want to come ride an off-road contract, you can do, basically, we'll let you do whatever you want to. So I signed a contract with them to be a PR guy because some of the money was coming from the public relations Suzuki department mm-hmm. and some was coming from the off-road. And so we basically signed up that I'd do the ISDE, which was in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 94, and uh, selected races. And so that's how um, I, I went to the first GNCC race uh, in Ocala and had a great race with Scott Summers and, and won my first GNCC event. And, and that, that was, it was good because it was a short event. When the track was short, there wasn't a lot of shortcuts because everyone's out there in Ocala and there's people all through the trees. And so the track was, um, you, you couldn't shortcut. You could shortcut maybe 20 or 50 feet. It, it, and Summers was good at that. And uh, that's just the type of racing it was. But the funny thing about that race was Summers passed me three times during that race. And he came back into the trail green because he was pulling so many vines off of him going, doing his cheater lines. And uh, I'd pass him back on motocross track because it had the Ocala, Ocala motocross track. And uh, so uh, ended up a, a, a great race. And I make comments about it because the GNCC in, in 1980 uh, or 1994, 95, 96, if it was a 12 mile course, it would end up being 10 miles by the time. The, the last lap was out because so many people would take a cheater line and then that cheater line got so developed the next lap around people were cutting that cheater line to be shorter and shorter <laughs> and i hated it i kept going to those guys going on my best day i can run with these guys but i'll tell you right now steve hatch and uh randy hawkins they were better than me in the tight trees they could wiggle through those trees so fast just it, it amazed me how good they were on a tight tree section. But if there was something with the jump in it through the trees, or maybe the little bit faster stuff, I kind of had that. Um, it, it won't bother me if I hit the ground, and so uh, I, I could take chances and I could run with them. But if you're saying who could cheat the best to win, it, I just I didn't like it at all. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, with with that kind of uh, I guess insider information. And now you think about all those championships that those three guys you just mentioned had won. Uh, makes you look at things a little bit different. But look, those are the rules. You know, of- I, I have a ton of respect for those guys because, I, granted, if even we were on the same course, Randy Hawkins, Steve Hatch, Rodney Smith, uh, Scott Summers, all those guys would absolutely beat me. If they were running their good day and I was running my good day, they were better than me. But, you know, just because they might be better doesn't mean that that means that's the way the race is going to finish. Right. You can have a good start. They can have problems. But when they when you add in the what 100 foot cut lines you can come out with, you know, Scott Summers would go through and put pink ribbon on the trail so he'd know where you can find a little shortcut. And uh, so Wanda and I would walk the trail. We'd see those pink ribbons. We'd change the location of them because we didn't know. I could never. I'd see the pink ribbon. I'd look all around for. There's got to be a cut line somewhere through here. And um, Randy Hawkins and and uh, the other guys would put little stacks of rocks up by the tree, and you could see that going. Okay, that's where I can make this left hander and cut off 40 feet here or whatever. But uh, you know, that's just the racing. That's the way it was. Yeah. You know? So I'm not saying that. It's not my type of racing, and I bagged on them, especially those dusty. You know, you wanted to stay out front. You didn't want you. It was very hard to come from behind unless you found a, a cut line that you could get around them. So, and and anyway. and in all fairness, their cut line is only good for the first time they do it. After that, everybody sees oh, it. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's that's why I said it keeps getting every lap. The track would get shorter and shorter because all these lines and there wasn't a directive to stop it. You know, I mean, it was basically. It, if you met your um, checkpoint in the back, which they'd have barrels up that you rode through, and you met your checkpoint at the front, mm-hmm. it, it was really a, a, a 
blind eye to the fact that they were making these big uh, cuts. Was was that the only year you raced Grand Nationals? No, I on and off ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. Okay. I did. I did. And in fact, I, when I um, didn't have a contract, but I wanted to go ride with um, whenever I rode KTM and Husa Birds, um, I did some GNCC stuff back then. But it was all for fun. After a three year break from racing there. At 40 years old, in 2002, you went and put out another full season on the national circuit. I mean, after a few years of taking a rest, was the couch just not for you? I mean, what motivates a 40-year-old guy to go out and race motocross again? You know, I, I, I was talking to Wanda the other day about what got me motivated. I think it was the fact that I was on a – I went and rode – you know, I, I was working for KTM. Yeah. And this guy – brought to a local race a 520 KTM with a 540 kit in it on Olin suspension. And he let me ride it at a local race. And I came out of there going, this bike is the funnest bike I've ever been on. The suspension was real soft, enduro setting, super soft. And that's kind of the way I like my bikes were soft. Yeah. And um, the 540 had monster horsepower. And so it kind of was that guy – I think his name's Gary with a super bike store, KTM out of Indiana. And he's the one who really twisted my arm to make a commitment to do it. And so um, after making the commitment going, I'm going to go out there and ride. Then it was uh, Lane Smith with Extreme Motor Company heard through the Internet that I was looking for a sponsor. And so he, they came on board and uh, provided some money for uh, me to go hit the races at 40. And yeah, it was all just to see what I could do. I was I was riding KTMs, working as a sales rep for KTM, and uh, life is fun. Life is good. Go race. Yeah, you know, guy, I think you finished like number forty nine that year. And and how many guys are signed up for something like that? Is it like it was in the old days where there's a uh, nine hundred? Oh, yeah, that was a, that was an earned number. I, I was eleventh in point standings with two rounds to go and broke my shoulder at Millville. Three hmm. rounds actually. I broke my. Um, and it was only the motocross. I didn't ride any supercross in, in 2002. So, um, yeah, that 540 was good. I whole shot at Ricky Carmichael and Kevin Windham. And I can have some big names that I, I beat them off to start. That's the only place I beat them, but that was fun. It was good. <laughs> you, you, is that how you got a job with KTM? Because you went and worked for them uh, after that as a team manager and a sales representative. What, what team did you manage? Who was on it? Tell me more about that. Well, I wasn't the factory guy. I was the South Central Regional Sales Rep, okay. and I only had uh, 15 dealers to call on whenever I first started. And you know, Rod Bush, the uh, president of KTM USA, yes, was who. When it kind of goes back to Suzuki uh, dropping the ball in 1997. Here I am, a guy that's been motocross, off road. I just love motorcycles. I'm going to race forever and ever. And uh, I, I don't see an end to Suzuki relationship. I think it's going to be good. And in December, I keep not getting a contract, but the contract is promised to me. Oh, yeah, the bikes are on the way. And your contract, Mel Harris has it on the desk, and it just hasn't been signed yet. So, you know, you don't get panicked about it. Well, Randy Hawkins calls me in December and says, guess what? Um, I just got axed from Suzuki and you're next. And I go, well, they tell me the contract's in there. And I go, no, it's not. So I call up and uh, Mike Webb wouldn't even answer the phone I, whenever he answered. And I said, hey, I hear there's not a contract. And he goes, oh, you need to talk to Joe Colombero. So Joe Colombero gets on the phone and uh, tells me I can ride anything I want to. And a Suzuki won't care. And I go, uh, what do you mean? He goes, well, we don't have a ride for you. And I go, well. It doesn't have to be money. I'm Suzuki all the way. Just loan me some bikes and I'll go race. And they said they wouldn't even give me one motorcycle. So with that, I was pissed off. I, you know, I, I was done with the Japanese because you're a number to them. Yeah. And so I called. I didn't want to call any of the Japanese manufacturers. So I call up Rod Bush and say, hey, my parents were a Penton dealer back in the day. And Rod Bush goes, I remember your brother, Chuck. And uh, so... Uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, I really don't want to commit to anything. I just want to ride motorcycles. And in about a week's time, I had two Husabergs and two KTMs delivered to my house with no contract. It was just a over the phone, word of mouth. 
and uh, you know, a good old buddy, you could say handshake deal, but there wasn't even a handshake to it. It was just over the phone. And so I started racing KTMs and Husabirds, just whatever I wanted to do. And at the end of 97, Rod had me come to California, didn't even tell me what it was for. And I sat in a meeting and he looked over at me and he goes, I think you might want to do this. And the sales reps at the time, there's only five of them. And they go, this is your new sales rep for uh, central part of the United States if he'll take the job. And he looked right at me. <laughs> I go, what? I, I guess I'm taking a job. So uh, it, it turned out really good to work for KTM. And as far as the team management, as far as the, the factory, yeah. I was since I was a South Central Regional Sales Manager, I had $16,000 in budget. So that whole $16,000 went to Corey Francis, John and Jeff Hedden, and Kenny Bartram were my four central, South Central riders. And you know, we'd take trailers and we'd go to different races and just had a good time with it. You know, you just mentioned Kenny Bartram. Are, are you his uncle? Yes. I, I have two nephews that grew up here at the shop and they'd have to clean the floor and hang tools up and work with me. They, they'd say it was uh, child labor laws I <laughs> uh, <laughs> messed up on, but uh, they were kids that, that uh, you know, they had all hand-me-down riding gear and and bikes I had. So yeah, the relationship with the two uh, nephews turned out pretty good. Well, now, you know, you, you were known as the jumper airtime and Kenny went on uh, to be, what was the, what did they call him? The cowboy or anyway, he was a, he was an extreme rider, a freestyle. So yeah, I taught him everything. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, uh, so you he guys, did, he, he did get to go ride with me with, with my freestyle before it was a, uh, freestyle in Europe, there would be always a uh, jump contest, and you know, I, I a lot of times win those. If it wasn't uh, my, Mad Mike Jones uh, doing a bigger crash than me, uh, he, he was pretty popular. And then there was also Jeremy McGrath started doing the knack knacks and the separating body from the bike, yeah. And I, I was terrible at I could just pancake it flat or crash, and uh, but. There were times where it was done with the sound meter and I would have the crowd going louder than the decibel meter was for the other guys jumps just because they were expecting something big from me, you know, so it, it was good old days. Yeah, it, it certainly was. Then you got involved with little pit bikes and I say little, but it was a big business there for a while and you were riding them, you were racing them and I understand you got involved with a company from China. But everything didn't quite pan out. So let's go over that for a minute, if we can, Guy. Where did the pit bike thing come into play, and uh, how far did you think that was going to go, and why didn't it go much further? Well, it goes back to my sponsorship that I had when I was 40, uh, Extreme Motor Company. Mm -hmm. uh, the CEO of the company was Lane Smith, and Lane was bringing over four-wheelers and scooters, and he had the idea of getting in on the – um, first level, whenever this whole uh, pro circuit had the Honda Mini Trail 50s and, you know, they were doing the, what was Mini Trail 50s? It was a Honda 50 backyard racing. Yeah. And that, that kind of exploded in California, but it hadn't come across the United States yet. And Lane goes, we can build a Honda 50 copy in China and bring it over here and we can race them and that type of thing. So uh, we got to fly over there at the end of 02. Uh, I flew to China with Lane, and he showed me his ideas. And at that time, both my nephews, Kenny and Dennis Hudson, had Honda 50s, and their forks were bent back, their handlebars were bent, you know, all the little things on a Honda 50 that happens when you go and jump them as an adult on a Honda 50, mm -hmm. you tear up. And so I had a little cheat sheet of let's do better forks, better brakes, better this. You know, I had a whole list. and. Uh, we spent about nine months in China developing that Honda Fit, that uh, Extreme 50, and uh, I learned a lot from the Chinese. Uh, they are terrible. Uh, it's a uh, it's a situation where it's they take your knowledge, but they won't. Uh, one of my examples I can do real quick is sure. They they would. I would go over there on the chalkboard and write up. We've been talking about a CR2, which will have this. And we'll like, we want to be a moving target. We want to be, because everyone's going to copy what we make. So 
we need to have something down the works that's going to be a little better. So we'll go to a little better brakes. We'll go a little better uh, motor. And, you know, we had this um, forecasted um, maybe two years down the road how we wanted to develop it and how we wanted to market it. And they would take our end one and turn around and produce it behind our back and try to sell it to our competition. And we had catch him and we'd tell you guys. Well, my example is we caught them with a whole bunch of frames they had produced to send to another company. And so Lane gives them this contract that says, you owe us 175000 before we leave. And I'm all worried. You know, we're in a communist country with a, a contract saying they're going to take their house in Malibu if they don't um, give us this money. And But I learned right then that the Chinese, because I'm asking the translator, I go, this is horrible. Why would the, um, oh, oh, I didn't get to my point. My point was, we give them this $175,000 contract that they have to pay us or we're going to take their Malibu home that the owner has. Yeah. And um, the owner of FIM, FYM uh, factory starts patting, laying on the back and getting all pally with him, ordering sake or whatever the Chinese <laughs> alcohol drink is. Yeah. And, Everyone's happy. And I, I turn to the translator and I go, why is this? In America, you sue your boss and, you know, you're fired or you don't get to, you're not happy about it. Right. And the translator said in China, it's a man's power that has respect. It's not the man's word. And it totally came to, I mean, I saw it firsthand that uh, has nothing to do with how you explain to them, how you want it. They, they, it's all about the power struggle. And so a lot of things you learn in China. Interesting. And did you say a little bit earlier you were there for nine months? No. I. We, it took us nine months to develop oh, okay. the, the, our little extreme 107. I went over there about a dozen times. Okay. Well, and, and, and that was it. I mean, the deal fell apart and you went on. Well, yeah, I, if our company would have worked with us a little bit more, I, I, honestly, I'd have made millions off of it. It was an awesome deal. Uh, Lane Smith, really good guy, knows a lot about how to, to market things. And uh, our company just was was uh, not good to us. Um, Lane was good to me. Lane was good to his um, employees and stuff. It just it didn't turn out that well for the, as a factory. As we talked about earlier, Guy, bicycles were a huge part of your life. Uh, early on, I, I guess they still are. You have a large collection of antique bikes. I thought I read 500, but I also saw somewhere where it said you had 1,100. What are some bicycles that you have that might be an interest to some of our listeners that are that are rare and unusual? Um, the collection is over 1,100. Okay. It, it'd be pushing the 1,200 mm -hmm. mark mm -hmm. uh, with one semi-trailer with over 700 frames in it from the 20s to the 60s. So uh, yeah, I, I'm loaded with bicycles. My dad, when he retired, loved bicycles, didn't have, when he was having the bicycle shop through the 60s and 70s, he wasn't in the, in the position to save some of the really cool bikes that he liked as a kid. Mm -hmm. So in, in the mid 80s, he did what the pickers did. He went to all these motorcycle swap meets, because they typically have a bicycle area at the motorcycle swap meets in Ohio and Pennsylvania and swap motorcycle parts for bicycle parts. And so uh, he's passed away now, but he has left me with uh, over a hundred wood rim bicycles, turn of the century wood rim bikes. Um, the oldest bike that he collected was a 19, an 1868 French made high wheeler penny farthing. And uh, I've got a 1880s all wood, even the hubs are wood, handlebars, a wood frame bike from the 1880s. And then um, some other cool ones, shaft drive bikes from the turn of the century. And then, so most of the guys listening now probably don't care about 100-year-old stuff. But I do have some Schwinn Stingrays in the crate, some apple crates, lemon peelers, mm -hmm. stickers. Um, got a gray so ghost? The fastbacks, yeah. I've got about 100 Stingrays. What about a gray ghost? You got one of those? I did. I did have a gray ghost before uh, some kids broke into a shop down on Ninth Street and stole the gray mm. ghost and the orange crates about eight 
um, crate models and spray painted them. And my parents got so mad that they sold them off. Oh, now you, you do a lot of selling on eBay too. Uh, what, what is your eBay handle in case anybody's looking for vintage bicycle parts? What's your name there? Uh, Cooper's Antiques 12, both plural. Cooper's Antiques 12. And it's just a bunch of parts. I, 10,000 parts or more that I've got. I've got maybe a uh, thousand parts on eBay now. I, I need to do a lot more. It just, it's, it takes a lot of time to do that. Now, what about your motorcycles and memorabilia for that in your collection? What, what do you have there? Your, your championship bike? What else, you, what else have you collected as far as I, motorcycles? I, I kept a lot of, I was like my dad, I kept a lot of stuff. So I've got all my trophies and I try to bring what I could from Europe back. So um, I've got a lot of my European trophies. And about 10 years ago, um, my class reunion was coming up and I have a swimming pool behind the house. They were going to do the sign up here. And I found all these showcases from a jewelry place and I bought all the showcases and put the trophies under glass and put bikes behind the showcases. And so uh, my wife and I and, and her parents spent about seven weeks with no air conditioning in one of the buildings mm. and, and put it all up. So it looks really nice. We have a good display of, of uh, the bikes and stuff. So yeah, I've got three of my old work Suzuki's. Suzuki only knows one of them, but I have three of them. And then some old Hondas, but none of that stuff has any works parts on it. Even though it's the bike I finished second at the LA, LA Coliseum or second in the, or third in the 89 series, it's just, they're really amazingly stock looking bikes. So is, is your building open to the public? Is it a museum guide that people can come in and see your stuff? I'm not really open to the public as far as having hours, right. but um, if you get a hold of me and I'm in town, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always welcome to bring it. I, I, it's kind of better. If there's a group of five or six guys that come in that way they can walk through and you can kind of show them everything. And uh, yeah, it, it's so to get a hold of me, you you can do that through any of the uh, motorcycle shops in town and bicycle shop. Um, and also, I, I do have a Facebook or Instagram account. Sure. And, and how big is that building? Guy? Um, I, well, my wife's looking at me now, so I don't know if I should tell you. No, it's all good. <laughs> it's about 18,000 square feet. One building? I'd be racing the Nationals and one building would fill up with junk. So I'd uh, buy another building, have another building built on the property. So, yeah, there's three big buildings here. Hey, Guy, uh, People were, were asking me, too, to ask you about the American Pickers episode. How long did it actually tape, uh, take to tape that segment? And uh, just how real is a reality show? It, it was about a 10-hour day. It was a long day. It was in December. It was freezing cold. And uh, I'll be nice about it. There's a lot of setup to it. You oh, know, yeah. They kind of want to prearrange. You know, that We've talked to Danielle, and they, we expected them to come in. Wanda and I never got to talk to Danielle. We kind of missed that part of it. But um, they're a little arrogant, um, and it, it's a little difficult to work with them because they want you to uh, – they, they kind of got you backed into a corner. They'll ask, do you know what this is? And I'll say, yeah, that's a chain guard from a 1940 Schwinn. Well, they'll throw that chain guard back into the shelf and don't care if they scratch it or bend it up. And so you kind of get on that um, – no, Mike, what is that? And then he'll stick it right in front of your face and explain to you, which you already know what it is, but they kind of want you to play the dumb part. And then they'll shoot you a price about 10% of what it's worth. And I wanted the pickers to come back because it does put you on the mark. People see that, you know, that you're on TV and that they, they, you have a bunch of bicycles. Sure. But I really wanted to tell the story of my grandparents and my parents, because I thought that was a neat story. And they covered my parents pretty well. They didn't do much on the grandparents, but they covered that pretty well. So now, are, are you telling me that, what, what's the stars of the name, the stars of the show, Mike and? Mike and Frank. Are, are, are they the guys that are arrogant like that? Or are, are there other producers and people? Who, who's? It all, we just basically talked to Mike and Frank. And just, I, I, I throw that arrogant out there just because, you know, you, you see Mike and they say he's the, he knows everything about Indians. Well, I have about 15 Indians, and my dad lived the 48 through 53 vertical twins. He loved the vertical twins. Yes. And Mike comes in. I got a whole row of vertical twins, and he looks at those and walks on going, I'm not into the British bikes. And I go, <laughs> Mike, 
those aren't British. Those are the last of the American made in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. And, you know, it, for the diehard Indian guy, it is kind of the nail in the coffin because they tried to produce a, a smaller bike and it didn't go over well. So where they thought they were going to sell 100,000 in four years, they sold less than 25,000 and it broke the company. But so Mike asked me all these questions and then this was cameras off and cameras go back on and Mike goes, these were the last of the American built Indians. And it was like, Oh, I see. Uh, you know, I, I gave him his, uh, lines that he needed to tell. Oh my gosh. That is absolutely incredible. <laughs> Unbelievable. The, the unrealities of, of, of the reality show pickers. Uh, it, it, that's just, I, I'm yeah. speechless. I now, really now some am. of the older bicycle stuff, you yeah. really didn't know a lot more than I did. And then some of the old Indian stuff, say, I only know the vertical twin. You go to the V twin or the inline fours, all that's his stuff. He, he had a, he had a, a better um, knowledge on it, but it's just kind of funny that, um, he, he asked me off the record, then he goes back online and says it. So, well, a guy in, in 2012, it was the first time I had met you and you've met a million people. So you wouldn't remember that, but it was at Unadilla for the MX rewind and you rode the wheels off an easy Jim's bull taco. And another year you were there and you were on Can-Am, which was prepared by a really good friend of mine, Oscar Gaten. Do you still race vintage events? Um, I do a little bit. I uh, didn't go this year. I uh, had planned on it, and then it got, with COVID, you sure. know, it got canceled. And so the canceled, the reschedule was on the same weekend. I had an antique motorcycle group out of Wichita that came down to tour the museum. And so I, they had had to reschedule it because of COVID. So I didn't want to uh, cancel them a second time. So um, that's why I didn't go race uh, Diamond Dawns this year. Diamond Dawns, the the that's a great race to go to. And the, the MX Rewind, if it was closer to me, you'd see me every year there. That's awesome. It's just a long ways to get there and get bikes prepped. It is. And when you were riding that Bull Taco, I mean, how did how was that bike set up? Just for you? Did you spend any much time on it at all before you rode oh, it that I, day? I, lo I love the Bull Tacos. I, I basically like all the short bikes, you mm -hmm. know, the 75 and older. Yeah. Uh, you know, the four-inch travel. It just fits me well. I, I like flat tracking it into the corner. Uh, suspension's terrible, but I can adapt to the bike. Brakes are terrible. I can adapt to that. When you go into the 80 stuff, um, then it's kind of how much money do you want to put into it? How much better do you want to make it than it ever was in 1981? You know, yeah. you can make some of those bikes so much better than they were today. Sure. Even even Easy Jim's Bull Tacos, you know, he had the the front porch with the simulator in them, which made them better than they ever were in 1975. Mm -hmm. And um, the brakes weren't any better. I, I testify to that. I don't think the brake, there were brakes on that bike that I rode, but um, you could Flintstone it better than you could do anything else. Flintstone it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and then the Can-Am, Oscar had me set up with it with the first Can-Am and I liked it. I did the sky shop, the 90 footer on it, yeah. but I broke the frame and I came back in and I said, Oscar, the foot pegs a little lower on one side and the other side. And he was thinking millimeters. He goes, yeah, I've been wanting to adjust it. And I go, no, I want you to come look at it. He went over and looked. It was like one inch lower. The frame was broke underneath. So he had to dig his other uh, Can-Am out for me, which didn't run as good. The one that I wrote, I wish I could have rode that one um, all day because it, it was awesome. But easy, Jim. He set those bikes up, and uh, you know, here, he's, here's a guy that's 80 years old that that lived the life on the bull tacos, and his family and all his friends all ride bull tacos. And um, what what a great family, and what an opportunity for me to, um, you know, I went down with a pit because my brother had a. Um, I remember my brother racing a 400 Penton, so. Um, I prepped a 400 Penton from Oklahoma, went to Diamond Dawns and raced it the first year. And that's when Easy Jim goes, would you mind riding the Bull Taco? And my response was, my parents sold Bull Taco, so I'm not a trader. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been on Bull Taco ever since. Now, it makes me think about something that if you were, you know, you turned pro in 1980, had you been born five years earlier than you were born, you might have been right there in the mix uh, when motocross in its heyday, 1975-76. You think you'd have done pretty good back then? I, I would say you would have too. If, you know, if absolutely. You... Just because I, you know, I had that BMX background, and 
you know, there's no suspension on a bicycle Mm -hmm. and I could launch a bicycle 40 feet over my van, land on flat ground. (laughs) And so jumping a motorcycle was easy to me. You know, part of the why I DNF so many races in the early eighties in the expert class, because I I just launched the bike, but the bikes weren't set up to handle. I broke front wheels. I think I broke eight front wheels my first year in the pro class. So let me ask you this guy, what do you think about, today's crop of young racers and who are some of your favorites? Well, I can say it'll never be what it was. Right. And I, I miss that because I, when I look back at grassroots racing, what we grew up on, you know, we went out there, we loved riding motorcycles. We liked the competition. Of course we all wanted to win, but it was a bunch of guys that enjoyed the sport, but we didn't have the, science behind us you know we didn't know when to eat when to train when to sleep uh and i don't i i I don't like it i I don't know any way of getting around it um other than saying i I want the guys to party all night eat a double cheeseburger and then let's go race you know (laughs) yeah (laughs) and then we'd maybe see some different riders up front but these guys that are like um, I'm going to say they're, they're little robots because they're told when to ride, when to get their heart rate up, what to eat, when to eat, how to eat. Um, and there's a, a psychological uh, trainer. There's a, a nutrition trainer. There's a mechanic for practice. There's a mechanic for the race bike. There's a suspension mechanic. Yeah. You know, there, there may be 10 people behind that one rider. And that's what we'll never get back. We won't get back the guys that you just go out there and ride. And another problem is the bikes are too good. The bikes are too fast. Bikes handle too good. Let, let's have it to where, hey, you overshoot this jump and you have a chance of your forks bending. Um, you know, your, your spokes will break. Uh, handlebars will bend. Um, you know, the bikes now are so good. You can, you can have a heck of a cartwheel and get right back up on the bike and go. And the bikes can can handle all of it yeah so, so um that's where i like the marty trikes 100 cc bike because that bike you know the brakes are, are good but not great um suspension's good but not great and the horsepower you can only ring out so much horsepower out of a yz 100 right and um fantastic racing in it but you can't i i would say let's i i i said this before and i'll say it again the AMA needs a one twenty, a two-stroke class and a four-stroke class. The size, I haven't. I sometimes I go. It needs to maybe be a one seventy-five two-stroke, and then in the four-stroke, three hundred, three fifty. Because I don't want to. I don't want to take out uh, the Western Pike. You know, if you had CC limit and you're a Western Pike size guy, it, it's going to hurt him if you said it could only be a 125 two stroke, you right. know, or a 300 two, uh, four stroke. But at the same time, how much horsepower do we need? You know, it'd be nice to get this down a little bit so it comes back into racing. So if you had a magic wand, you would create a two stroke class uh, in the AMA again at a professional level like they had in the old days, 125s, 250s, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I mean, we only need one two-stroke uh, two class and one four-stroke class because it kind of works out good in an outdoor venue to have two classes, both of them being premier classes. I, I, I always liked that back in the day whenever they would say the 125, 250, and 500 were all premier. They weren't trying to take one away from another. And it needs to be the same way here. There's a two-stroke guys that like the two stroke and there's the guys who like the four stroke and they both have the same type of point system and um notoriety you could say to it right and and but it's it'd be a tough one to to sell it just i think it needs to be there so um with supercross do you watch it do you like it or it's just not your cup of tea oh no i i watch the outdoors i watch the supercross i i i'm still a fan Mm -hmm. i still like seeing it um I, I can see the guys who give it their all. I, I get really mad whenever I see a guy fall down and his brake lever bends and he pulls into the pits to have the brake lever adjusted. Um, <laughs> I, I yell up and down. I yell at the TV. That's not a champion. Um, you know. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, I get it, guy. I do. I do. I, but I like the Osborne. You know, Osborne to me is a guy that he can crash, his handbars can be folded down to the tank, and he will still attempt to finish. You might he rode with the front flat, everyone's saying he should have pulled in. Yeah. No way. 
he would not have received a single point if he pulled in. There was no way they could have done a front tire change and get out to mer- earn any points. And he earned five points. Yeah. yeah. Had, uh, um, Cincerella had a little better last moto, it could have come down to a five point change on whether or not he was champion or not. So, um, yeah, I, I was I was very glad for Osborne to win the championship, and um, I like that grit. Whenever you know you, you do a crash, you get up and you finish. Yeah, and, and you know something of all the things Ricky Carmichael has said when I watched Supercross, the one thing that always stuck in my mind was when he said, "Your championships are won on your bad days." Yeah. So, and and uh, Anderson had a few of them, and uh, but there aren't many guys that will that don't have that kind of resilience and and just keep going. Hey, guy, what was Cooperland? Cooperland, does that still exist? No, it's gone now. In 97, I, or 96, I went to an RM Cup in Branson, Missouri, and it was awful. And I told Pat Alexander, I said, I could do better in my, at my practice track with the equipment I have. I could put on a better event. And he goes, well, it looks like you need to find some property. <laughs> so as it comes, when I got back, I mentioned it to a guy who, he was into building tracks and stuff, and he sent me a link to Oklahoma land auction. And within three weeks, we had wanted and I had bought 160 acres, and I sent Suzuki the information. And the funny thing is, this was whenever I was transitioning to I wasn't working for Suzuki anymore. I had a contract. With, I didn't have a contract. I rode KTM and Husa Birds, but Pat Alexander still knew that I could build a track and make it a good RM Cup. So. Um, we built the track, and he posted that the RM Cup was coming to Stillwater, and it, it came here two years, 97 and 98, I believe. Okay. You know, our, our time's getting close here, Guy, but I did want to include your family in our chat today. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your wife, how long you guys have been married, and do you have any children? Uh, yes. In two days, it'll be our 27th anniversary. I met her 27 years ago, and uh been married for 25 years on the 24th coming up in, in about five days mm-hmm. and so uh we adopted a girl 14 years ago uh caitlin and um a full terror no she's extremely smart she doesn't have the two-wheel gene on her but she um is a, a brilliant girl that that's um way smarter than me past my education in the third grade wow <laughs> That's, that's, that's good to hear, Guy. And uh, if there's anything else right now that I have not covered that you thought about throughout the interview, I'd be happy to give you a couple of minutes to uh, to go back over that. If not, uh, just let me know. Is there anything that we missed or something that you'd like to talk about? Uh, no, I, I think you covered it pretty good. Well. You had, you had better questions than I could have thought of. That, that was good to, to um, come up with knowing my history of it. And uh, so if anybody's around Oklahoma, they want to come see the museum, yeah. uh, be sure to let them get a hold of me. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be at races. Okay. And, and the and the eBay handle once more. It's uh, Cooper's Antiques 12. Cooper's Antiques. number 12. Okay. Well, and Joe, thanks for having me on. It was my pleasure, Guy. I want to thank you for uh, giving me some time this morning. And I hope everyone who's listening enjoyed it. And, of course, you could continue uh, listening to it anytime. It's always on It's always on Facebook. So, Guy, if uh, you or any of your family members or friends want to listen to the interview afterward, it's available at Vintage Motocross Radio. Thank you, Guy Cooper. Awesome. Awesome, Joe. And sorry that I go off on tangents and don't stay with the focus, but no. uh, that's that's been me all my life. Guy, that's what makes an interview interesting is when guys just come up with stuff like that, that, you know, I may not ask a question about it, but uh, the people want to know. So, no, All don't right. don't Thank apologize you. for that. That's what makes it great, guy. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, brother. Bye. Bye-bye. My guest this morning has been Guy Cooper. I want to thank our sponsors who make this show possible, Nightmare Racing, the best reproduction Kawasaki plastic on the planet, Paul Standard and Preston Petty, the legend continues, Amsoil, the first in synthetic oil since 1973, Full Circle Racing. Thank you, Tom McAllister. Anybody out there looking for rims, spokes, lacing, or truing for your vintage or modern bike, get a hold of Tom McAllister at Full Circle Racing. Curtis Lieberton, thank you, and Jay at Vinco. Keep the ride going. They've got over 650 products in their catalog, some great things that you're not going to find anyplace else. Chris Carter at Motion Pro, specialized tools, tables, and controls. That's Motion Pro. 
Be sure to visit our sponsors online and on Facebook. And don't forget next Sunday, October 25th, my guest will be the little professor, David Bailey. This is Joe Abadi. Thank you for listening to Vintage Motocross Radio. We'll talk to you soon.